Good morning, friends. Welcome. It's good to see everybody this morning. So excited to see you. It's so good to see your face. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're so glad that you joined us. And maybe this is your first time. We welcome you to the Desert Vineyard. Let's stand together. We're going to begin our time together with some music. We're going to worship God in song. I invite you to sing along and to worship with us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this time that we have together to worship you and lift our voice in praise and adoration of you. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to encourage one another in fellowship and to be encouraged by your word. Lord, be with us. Thank you for your presence. It's already here. Let's sing together. There's a song in my soul And I feel it stirring in me This I know for sure That your love is like a flood And your mercy never ending I give my song to you And there's a joy in my soul Oh 
lovely sound I hear it in the thunder and the rain It's raining in the skies Like cannons in the night The music of the universe plays Let's see i 
thank you that we can call in your name. It's in your name. In your name we find healing. It's in your name we find salvation, restoration. We speak your name over our city, over our church, over our lives. We give you glory, honor, and praise. And it's in your strong name we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah. It is good to be gathered together. We want to say hi to one another. If you're joining us online, thank you for finding us here. Say hi to one another in that chat online. You're still part of this community, and it's important. And in the room, go say hi to somebody, somebody you just saw again, somebody new. Well done, everybody. It's good to reconnect with those folks that we haven't seen in a while. Maybe it's just been a week. Maybe it's been months since you've seen someone. It's good to reconnect. It's good to say hi to new folks, begin a budding relationship. It's all good stuff. Hey, I've got a couple of announcements for us. First are these connection cards. You might have been handed one on the way in or at least asked if you've done it. We're trying to gather everybody's info so that we know who you are because uh, the church has been through some stuff in the last few years and it's always changing. And so it's time for us to kind of get a handle on who's showing up on a regular basis. And so even if you've been coming for 15 years, 25 years, we still want you to fill out a connect card so that we have that information. And if you're brand new, we'd love for you to fill that out and let us know that you're brand new as well. Um, And so we're going to take an offering into just a little bit, and you can put the card right in that offering bucket as it comes past. Or you can uh, meet us out in the lobby after service, and we'd love to make a face-to-face connection along with that card. Also, I just want to do a quick reminder about groups. We've got a QR code that's going to come on on the screen in just a second. And uh, if you are interested in groups or any of the events that happen on campus here, that's a direct line to our events page. Uh, Groups are just getting started for the new year, so it's a great time to join in and find connection that way. And then um, I just want to invite our serve team forward. We are going to do our offering. You know, every week we take time out of our service to be part of the time of giving. And we do that because it's an invitation from the Lord. And we do that because we want to love and serve God with all that we are. And so this is an opportunity to connect uh, our finances, our everyday life, the things that are sometimes the most concerning to us with our worship of God. And so I invite you to participate in that today. We're going to pray over that. We're going to pray for our youth who are up at winter camp. They're in the Big Bear area. And so uh, they're experiencing a little bit of weather and a whole lot of Jesus. And so we want to pray for both those things for them. So would you join me as we pray? Lord God, we do. We want to give you all that we are because you are the only one we can trust with all that we are. You are our creator, our father, our companion, our friend. And so we submit our finances to you. We submit our thoughts. We submit our emotions. All that we are, we give to you this morning so that you can do 
what only you can do with those things. God, we pray for the youth who are on their adventure this weekend. God, would you speak mightily to them on the mountaintop? Let this be a time of bonding with one another and bonding with you so that they are able to grow in their faith, take hold of it, take ownership for themselves. And God, we pray for each one here that today would also be a memorable experience with you as you touch our lives in the ways that only you can. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 I'm grateful that you are here. My name is Nathan. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here, and, I, and I'm excited to be with you. Um, I still feel like it's a fresh new year. Anyone else feel like it's a fresh new year? Yeah, can you just, uh, I'm just going to say happy new year, and, and I'd love to hear you yell back at me. And Maybe you're going to say it's going to be a happy new year, so when you say it, you're kind of proclaiming it. So happy new year. Happy new year. Oh, great job. You guys are way better than first. I'm just kidding. I tell them the same thing. So, uh, yeah, well, I'm glad you're here. One personal thing for me that I wanted to announce, small groups are so important, and I hope that you get involved in it. Our men's small group are, are going to be hosting a breakfast coming up on the 27th, that's in two Saturdays, a men's breakfast, and I want to personally invite you to be there. It, we are going to have an all-you-can-eat buffet um, situation there, so that'll be good, um, and it's, you can buy tickets on the way out later. But I want to, you to consider coming, if you're a man, to be there, to connect. It's a way, if you're like, I'm not ready for a full small group experience, but maybe I can connect on a Saturday. We want you to feel connected. I'll be speaking there as well. Second thing about it is I want you, if you have a young man in your life, and a young man could be like 13, 14, or up, I want you to consider coming and bringing them too. What you may not realize or forgot as an older man is when you were a younger man and you got invited to hang out with the big guys, that was a big deal. And it was kind of like a little bit of a rite of passage. So see that as an opportunity. If you uh, don't have money and you are looking for scholarships or you'd like to scholarship someone, um, we have those opportunities as well. So I encourage you to be there. It's a new year. And um, we're going to be talking about some amazing things right after this gathering at a town hall meeting right across the way where there will be food. And I know many of you came to this service because you're going over there, but we want to invite you to come and be part of it. And if you've seen these shirts on people, we'll explain what that's all about there. But if you don't come, you won't know until later. So it's kind of like a, a teaser kind of deal. So we hope that you'll be there. We'll talk about the new year as well um, as answering questions. We think it's really important, especially in the season of transition, for us to see each other, hear each other, um, and have a chance to celebrate what God is doing and where we're going. And where we're going this year has to do with story. Do you know that your story has power? You may not feel that way, but it does. Our stories, they, they have power, and they're an amazing tool in our world today to convey who we are and to communicate things. When we talk about the word testimony, it's a story that talks about the truth of a concept. And so this year, we're going to be talking about the story of God, the story of who he is and what he is doing and showing how God is effective in our community. So I encourage you to be part of that. This series, All Restored, is part of our story. God, uh, we, we, we learned last week that God is in the process of bringing restoration to us, that Jesus is going to bear in us restoration. He's going to bring it through. And I want us to be part of that, which means we have to participate. So you haven't heard the beginning of the series, jump in, go check it out online later. But today, we're going to dive in. The truth is that Jesus he'd be with the brokenhearted people in our world. If he came again, he'd be with those who are brokenhearted. He moved towards us in our pain to heal us. He moved towards our brokenness, the things that aren't right in our life, to restore us. He empowered us even to forgive those who hurt us so that we can rejoice and experience our wholeness without anything holding us back. The good news is because of Jesus, everything can be restored in your life. Every one of us 
has been hurt in this room and online. Yes, everyone has been hurt. We are hurt by relationships, by people within the church, maybe within this very church, hurt by circumstances and even by strangers. And this pain that we experience is not something God wants for us and it can lead us to bitterness. It can lead us to isolation, guardedness, and it can suck the joy out of our lives. And Jesus Christ meets us actually in this pain. He meets us there. Not when we get it figured out, not when we're all good. He meets us in the place of our darkness, our pain, and our hurt, and he offers to us restoration. That is really good news. But we have to participate. So this series is about you joining in on that, being part of it. Today, we're going to start that process, and we're going to work our way over the next couple of weeks to a place where we feel more and more freedom. And it's going to happen a little bit by surrender, just surrendering a little bit of our control to experience this freedom. I want to talk about Paul. Paul wrote letters to churches he established, and he wrote a letter to the Corinthian church in Corinth, and he's writing a letter to them. And if you got a letter from Paul, the apostle, most of the time it's because you messed something up or there's something that needed to be corrected. I would love to have Paul write a letter to the American church. I probably wouldn't love reading it, but I would love to have that kind of insight. And so he wrote this letter to the Corinthian church, and he's addressing a fight that's happening within it. So we're going to dive into 1 Corinthians 3. We'll be in it for the whole message. Encourage you to follow along. But in this letter, he says this, and I, Paul, brothers and sisters, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but only as fleshly, as to infants in Christ. Now, he's starting off kind of with an an admonishment. He's kind of like pointing something out. He's like, hey, I'd like to talk to you as spiritual people, as people who are following Jesus, as mature in the faith, but I can't. I got to talk to you as fleshly people, as infants in Christ. Fleshly, I love that. That's such a, a visceral word, like flesh, like sewage. You know, that word is just sewage, fleshly, like it, it's kind of like, okay, now I'm feeling uncomfortable. It's got a, it's got a ring to it, but I, I love it. Whenever I think of this word flesh, the word, by the way, in Greek is sarkinos. Sarkinos, it means made of flesh. For some reason, whenever I hear this word, all I can think of is big, huge hunks of like uncooked meat, you know, like a big, huge slab of bacon. Oh man, that's just, a, I, I, that's what I think of when I think of this word, mostly because I love bacon. Bacon is the best. Um, If you are a vegetarian or vegan, I am sorry for you because bacon (laughs) makes the world beautiful. If you're a vegan or vegetarian, good for you. More bacon for me. (laughs) This sermon is not about vegetarians. Uh, I promise. But Sarkinos is made of flesh, but it's not actually talking about the flesh. Some of us have a little more than others. It's talking about instead the desires of your body, the desires of humans, the desires inside of you, the things that we want, the things that drive us. And honestly, most of the time it's used in a negative connotation. It's the desires of this world that kind of rule us. It's our frailties, our inclinations, our heart motivations that are fleshly selfishness, anger, greed, the ugly things that we think and do, the motivations of our heart, our disposition, sarkikos, made of flesh. I try to think about how to describe this. And I'll, I'll explain something that would happen when I was younger. When I was younger, I loved to have lively arguments for the sake of arguing. It was playful for me. I would, I would argue anything. I'd argue the thing I didn't actually believe because I enjoyed arguing. I enjoyed it. It was fun. I would have a good time. But my brother, Jordan, he is a serious person. And he doesn't know that I was having fun. And so we would get into arguments. And it wasn't about me winning. I just wanted to keep the argument going as long as possible. He wanted to win. And so it would get heated and heated. And I'm not saying that things got broken in the house, but it probably did. Anyways, at some point, some relative, I think it was my father, said to my brother Jordan, he said, Jordan, you've got to stop arguing with Nathan. 
when are you going to realize that he's like a pig? I'm like, what? He's like, when you wrestle with a pig, everybody gets dirty. And at some point you realize that the pig is enjoying himself. (laughs) Happy as a pig in mud. I loved it. It was so much fun, right? My brother thinks we're trying to accomplish something. I just think we're having fun. That's what I think of. It's like this disposition to, you can't help it. This is who you are. You're like a, happy as a pig in mud. That's the flesh. He said it doesn't actually result in us being happy. It results in brokenness and pain and suffering, and it's not great. But sarkinos, made of the flesh, can't help it. But the faith And what we believe and what Paul was talking about and knew and experienced is that we didn't stay that way. Let me explain. When we learn about the kingdom of God, we know that someday Jesus is going to make all things new. He's going to restore our physical bodies. You know, we don't have restored bodies yet. We got problems and issues physically. He's going to restore those someday. And the same thing goes for our heart, our motivations, our fleshliness. He's going to restore it. He's going to bring his kingdom. He's going to rule. He's going to get rid of death. That's the age to come. That's what's going to happen. It will happen whether we participate in it or not. But the beauty, yeah, thank you, Jesus, someone said. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. That will happen. But the beauty of what is happening now is that the one day rule and reign of Jesus Christ in his kingdom when all peace and shalom and our bodies are made new and there's no more suffering and cancer and all that kind of stuff, that got brought into today when Jesus died and rose again on the cross. That he brings the kingdom of the not yet into the now. Tomorrow has met our today. Pastor David called it a deposit. Now what happens? In this moment, when we follow Jesus, we received something inside of us, a spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of the Holy Spirit, of the spirit of God. It changes us, transforms us, and something changes. We become righteous, meaning we can follow God. We can, he can rule over our lives. We are able to do that. Pastor David called that a deposit of the Holy Spirit that points to a full restoration someday. The fullness of the age to come becomes a real, tangible blessing today. And we are no longer made of flesh. We are now released from that, and we look like Jesus. It's as if Jesus drug the righteousness, blessing, and beauty of the kingdom into our very lives. And not only is that something that we get to experience, but it's something that we get to present to other people. That's why the church matters so much. That's why it matters to follow and go after God. It isn't just the inward transformation, but what we can present, we can present hope to people by showing them the kingdom of God as he reigns and rules in my life right now, which makes a change and people can see and experience and taste and see that God is good. So much of us, oh man, we get so focused as Christians. And, and, and this is really something that we have done. We have said, okay, someday I'm going to heaven. So I have some conversation about that. It's heaven, yes, heaven, but heaven on earth. God remakes the earth, he wreaks do up, right? That's what I'm talking about. We think about Christianity as I'm gonna get my jail, my get out of jail free card now. And then someday God w- will experience all the goodness of God. That's what we've made it about. And is that true? Yes. But we forget that Jesus' death on the cross didn't just buy us that, but brought us the kingdom now. And so we can experience this shalom and this peace and not being ruled by the desires of our hearts, but ruled instead by Jesus now. I think it's the most beautiful thing that we get to experience that and encounter it. But Paul, Paul's like, you guys have forgotten this. So let's dive back into 1 Corinthians 3, verse 2. He says, I gave you in the past milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to consume it. Some part of this is you accept Jesus and as you follow after him, there is a natural growth period. But he's saying like, man, I had to do this for you, but even now you are not yet able. 
You have not grown up into this. He's admonishing them. And he continues to say, um, he, oh, sorry, I scrolled down here. Here we go. He says, you are not yet able to consume it, but even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. There's that word again. For since there's jealousy and strife among you, church, you are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like ordinary people? So this word again, but it's not sarkinos made of flesh, it's sarkikos acting like flesh, characterized by flesh. This is a huge distinction. He is saying what you are now is no longer defined by the fleshly desires, but you are acting like it. And I can tell because you have strife and jealousy among you. I try to think about how I can explain the difference here because this is, this is a powerful moment. And I thought I, instead that I would just tell you a little fable, a little story if that's okay. Long, long ago in a galaxy far, far... <laughs> nope, wrong one. Sorry. That's a different one. In a different land, there was a pig. And the pig's name was Poof. Because I think Poof sounds funny. Poof wanted more than anything to not be a pig, but to fly. And she would stand at the edge of the pig pen with all the other pigs rolling in the mud and stare at the sky dream of soaring on rising wind, exploring, seeing what was beyond the mountains. A wandering wizard came by the pen and could discern the longing of Poof's heart. You see, the wizard had gained great understanding of the thinking of pigs because he had eaten so much bacon over his life. And he decided to grant Poof the power of flight. And in a moment, there was a transformation and Poof was now a bald eagle. The bald eagle took off and flew and the desires of her heart were so exciting to watch her. She, she flew everywhere she could. She explored, tasted new foods and eventually even had an eagle family. One day, as she was soaring, she looked down and saw her old pig pen. She saw the other pigs rolling in the mud made up of dirt, old food, water, and their own excrement because that's what a pig pen is. Poof thought to herself, doesn't that look fun? You know, there's some kind of faint familiarity in her, a longing. And so she flew down, promptly scared all of the pigs, terrified that a giant bald eagle, have you ever seen a bald eagle in person? They're huge. Showed up in the pig pen, but once they calmed down, she started to frolic and roll in the mud. But I didn't feel quite the same. You see, mud on pig skin feels very different, serves a different purpose than mud on feathers. And she began to get hot and uncomfortable and eventually said, this is no good and tried to scrape off the mud and couldn't get it off and then attempted to fly, but she couldn't. Once was an elegant, beautiful eagle, was now stuck in a pig pen, neither enjoying the mud nor being able to soar on the wind like an eagle. Can you imagine the farmer walking out and seeing this huge bald eagle rolling in the mud? I'd probably look at it and be like, nope. <laughs> what? back in. How ridiculous would that be? That's how Paul is talking to this church. How ridiculous. What are you doing? Do you not know that you are free and you're acting like this? It would be as ridiculous as an eagle in mud. Are you walking like an ordinary person? <laughs> are you not being fleshly, acting like flesh? You've been given a chance to live in a new reality and return instead you have done to the old. So what's the big deal? What was he actually fighting with them about? What was he trying to help them understand? Well, let's keep going. Verse four, this is the big deal. This is the big moment. He says, for when one person says, I'm with Paul, 
And another says, I am with Apollos. Are you not ordinary people? What is the problem here? The Corinthians were fighting over which man at the time were they following? Was it Paul who established church? Apollos? Maybe Cephas? Peter, we think? You know, who are you following? And they would start following him and they would start arguing and he would saying, this guy's better than this guy and this guy's better than this guy and he wrote this and this one's letter so we should do this and Apollos wrote this and arguments, strife, othering, splitting, of the church of God. What had happened is that they had started to follow a personality. Man, we get that nowadays, don't we? We understand that. The cult of charisma, the power of personality, it's all around us. Our inherited culture. Now, why did I say inherited culture? In the church, we like to say like, oh, the culture out there is infiltrating here. Instead, I would say it's inherited here and we're trying to be something different for the culture out there, okay? Because we like to think that we're, we're kind of a default okay, but I'd say we're not a default okay. We're a default where we've absorbed what's around us. And so we have made it a cult of personality as well, centered around a leader in the church, usually the person who preaches. And so what we have done is we've done the same thing. We said, well, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul, I follow Nathan, I follow Audra, I follow David, whatever you want to say. Maybe it's easier for you not to think so close to home. I really like Stephen Furtick. I like Joel Olstein. And I just said that, and there are people in the room who are like, Stephen Furtick is a heretic and Joel Olstein is too. Did someone, don't raise your hand, but you know you just saw that. You just felt that. Mark Driscoll, now I've got triggered everybody. <laughs> we are not much different, are we? So this doesn't just apply to the church. Of course not. TikTok influencers, celebrities, leaders of companies, leaders of political parties. What we have done as we have elevated man. And in so doing, we're acting like pigs in mud. Back to the scripture, verse 5. So he says this. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? By the way, if you're writing something, writing in the third person is like a power move. You know, just be like, what is Paul? What is Nathan? You know, like it helps you. What is he saying? He's like, what are these people? And then he uses a word. It's servants. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? servants. This is a lowly term. This isn't some elevated term. He's saying we're people who wait on tables and, and through which you've believed in Jesus, but that is our role. Even as the Lord gave opportunity to us to lead you, it's, it's actually God who leads you. We are just servants. So if we're going to step into what God has for us for story this year and the things that are coming next, We need to step into restoration. And what it starts with is a renewed understanding of leadership. What is the point of leadership? Who are we as leaders in the church? And what is all of our relationship to each other? We're starting here. It's interesting. um, We have a lot of a celebrity culture, right? But this isn't just celebrity culture. They didn't really have a celebrity culture back then in the same way. We're, we're influenced by all that's going on around us, but back then, they're just influenced by their flesh. We've got both. We've got this desire inside of us to elevate men coming from our community and from our world today, but also in our humanity and our fleshliness. And I know this because this is the pattern from all of the Bible. That even in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, the people just wanted someone to follow. They didn't want to follow God. Israel comes out of slavery. They take him into the wilderness. They take him to a place where they're alone. They've been freed. And God comes and descends on the mountain and tries to speak to his people. And do you know what the people do? They say, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, no. I don't, no. I don't want to hear you. Just talk to Moses and Moses will talk to us. And it leads to all kinds of problems and issues. Then, even later, Israel's established, has has, follows God and the elders of the community and sees that all the other kingdoms around them have a king. And so they say, well, seems like the thing to do. 
let's have a king. And so they ask for God to give him a king. He says, I don't want to give you a king. They said, we want one. He says, fine. And they give him King Saul. And King Saul did some crazy bad stuff. And the one who followed him, David, was a little better, but he also, he, well, he did some real, he screwed up. Over and over and over again, you see that the desire of the heart of the human is to make someone responsible who isn't God, to rely on someone else. Jesus came in, and he took the not yet, and he drug it into the now, the future glory, rule, eternal, holistic health, everything. He brought it into the now. And that is who we should be, that we be characterized by the spirit of God within us. But what do we do? We accept something that's less than. We have more affinity for a preacher than we do for our savior. We've been given the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, to guide us in the Bible, to show us who he is, to walk with him as we did in the garden, to experience all of this. It's like the breath of life that has been given to us. And instead of breathing it in for ourselves, we turn our pastors or someone else into our rescue breather. What do I mean? Sometimes what happens either where you're scuba diving um, or, or someone is trapped under the water and they don't have access to oxygen, they're about to die, the people will rescue breathe. And what does that mean? That means they'll breathe, go up to the surface or to their tank, breathe in air, and then they'll blow it into the mouth of the person so that they can survive. It's secondary air. There's not as much oxygen in it, but it works. There's like a bunch of us that have this access to God to breathe in the very presence of God and we are satisfied instead to come and to get secondhand breath from a preacher. I tell you what, preachers have bad breath. <laughs> Especially while we're preaching, man. It dries out, stuff happens, halitosis, it's a thing. I got gum right here, man. That's what I try to write afterwards. You don't need that. We have made ourselves reliant, and when you put a human in a place that no human should stand, they will fail. They will fail. They will fail. Sometimes they fail because the expectations we place on them can never be met by anybody but Jesus. Sometimes they fail because the expectations weigh them so hard that they, they can't bear it because they weren't meant to. They fail for all kinds of reasons, but one of the reasons is because we have chosen, chosen to elevate them. And in so doing, we're acting in the flesh, in the worldly way of doing things. And God has offered us something more. What then is the role of leadership? Verse six, I, this is Paul, he's not speaking in the third person anymore. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. I have four pots in my office. I have planted many seeds in each one of the pots. Two pots are barren and lifeless, no matter what I do. And two have single little stalks. I'm growing Joshua trees. Everyone thinks I'm crazy. That's what I'm growing in there. They're like, don't you know those take like 50 years? And I'm like, yeah, let's see what happens. But man, I, I'm so happy with those two little shoots. But the other ones, I'm just staring at it and I'm like, grow! I've done everything. Watered it, everything, you know, I'm going to have to try to get some saran wrap. I don't know. I've done everything I was supposed to do. But do I have any power to make things grow? No. That is how it is. As servants of God, as leadership, our job is to make the soil ready to pour out the water, but we're just doing our job according to the grace God has given to us. It goes on to say that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now the one who plants and the one who waters are one. They're not even different. They're the same, but each will receive his own reward according to his labor. So we see here, hey, your job is to do what God has called you to do and to do it well. That's it. And you're judged by how well you do it, not by what grows. Because I do the growing. And then he says, for we are God's fellow workers. That's us, all of us. You are God's field. You are God's building. We are one. So a restored leadership is one where we understand our role. 
And we don't elevate people or put people in a place that they shouldn't be. Well, later, verse 21, he says this, just to bring home the moral of the story. So then, no one is to be boasting in people. I like this pastor, this preacher, that thing, this, that, no, no. And he says, for all things belong to, to you. All things belong to you. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the word or life or death or things present or things to come, things to come, the kingdom, all belongs to you in the now. And so we have placed our hope in human leaders. And specifically, in the church, we have elevated them to a place where they should not be. And so they fail over and over and over again. And it has resulted in dissension, just like it did in the Bible, in striving and and jealousy and people only showing up when certain people preaching and all kinds of stuff, silly things. Because we made it about the person and not about Jesus. But it's also resulted in real pain and suffering and hurt. Because when our expectations are not met, we experience frustration. And so as church leaders, we have to acknowledge that as a whole, as a church, we've engaged in this. But now it's time to look at church leaders. And when I even say that right now, there are people in this room, the people all over who are like, ooh, we're going to talk about church leaders because there's, there's some crazy church leaders out there. Maybe you came to church. It was really hard for you to come because the stories of church leaders who have failed are everywhere. And it's real. But for me, as a leader of a church, we need to recognize that in some ways we, in a lot of ways, in most ways, we have perpetuated this. We have caused this, this thing to happen. Maybe we accepted it, this the way it goes, but we've made it happen. We have allowed this practice to continue. And if there is true restoration of leadership and true restoration in the church, if this is going to happen, it has to start with the leaders of the church and what they have chosen to do. And so the purpose of everything I've said to this point is to get to my next thing. And my next thing is that as a church, we have to acknowledge and deal with the fact that there is hurt in our church, in Desert Vineyard, in our church as a whole. There are people here who have been hurt here. There are people who here who have been hurt somewhere else, and that's why they're here. There's people here who've been hurt decades ago. What do I mean when I say hurt? Church hurt. It's when people are emotionally, mentally, spiritually, or even physically damaged by those they thought they could trust. That could be a leader in the church as like a pastor, but it could also be a leader as a small group leader. It can go on and on and on. That's very ugly. It's very painful. And honestly, as a church, we don't like talking about it. Because ironically, we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Like, they already hurt. They already hurt. And if we truly believe that Jesus Christ has brought the kingdom into the now, and that his forgiveness and love and empowerment and his spirit could be inside of us, then we have to actually engage in this. And, and while I say that, I know that it's incredibly difficult to do. The idea that I'm in church in a place where I got hurt, that I'm going to open myself up a little bit to be vulnerable with that very hurt is to open myself up to being hurt again. Ooh. So in this space, as I've been praying and fasting about this moment coming up next, about this series. As I've been listening to the Holy Spirit, God said, this is the time for this church to engage in this. I'm like, really? This is like my fifth month here. And he's like, yes, this is time. Because I believe that God is coming to bring healing to us, to bring healing in the deep parts of us. So this weighty moment that's about to happen, I, I acknowledge it's weighty. And I just invite you to be safe. That it's a safe place that you can open yourself up and maybe receive some healing. We're gonna do this for the rest of the series, but I wanna focus specifically first on how the leadership of this church and churches in general, myself, people, it wasn't even me, have played a role in church hurt because restoration doesn't come without repentance. But repentance 
lays the framework for revival. And so as a leader in the church, I'm going to take a moment, and I've written out some things to pray about. Scripture says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly, and I'm going to own that. Own that I have a role to play and that I've failed people in the past and I'll probably keep failing people in the future. And it may not look like some big, huge scandal or anything, but it may just look like me stepping into the flesh and allowing myself to act as if I'm not just a servant, not just one of you, that we are together and belong to each other. We've experienced pain in this church. And maybe it's not just this church. Maybe you've experienced from leaders, from other churches, whatever. I I want us to open up and let God speak to us about leadership in general. But this ongoing pain and guardedness because of the hurt within us has resulted in more suffering, damaged relationships, and not feeling the peace and shalom of God. And this spiral of bitterness that causes us to act a certain kind of way that hurts other people, that blah, 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 blah. It gets in the way of the kingdom work Jesus wants to do. So I'd encourage you just to close your eyes if you want to and listen. And imagine that you're hearing God that speak to you and the Holy Spirit is gonna use these words to bring healing. And I'm choosing today to stand and ask for forgiveness for leadership's collective shortcomings. God, be here. God, I already sent you here. I know you're marking in people right now. And so God, on behalf of the leaders, I ask that you would allow me to stand in the gap. God, forgive us for returning to the desires of our flesh instead of living in the new life the Spirit of God. God, we have become would-be kings who build our brand and our personal kingdom over cultivating the seeds of your kingdom that you have planted in your people. Lord God, forgive me. Jesus, forgive us. We have chosen to preserve the named organization over the mission of Jesus and always at the expense of your sons and your daughters. Lord God, forgive me. Jesus, forgive us. We have isolated and made people to feel as other, as if they don't belong because they didn't agree with our views of theology in politics. Lord God, forgive me. Jesus, forgive us. We repent of arrogance and pride that made us at times calloused and dismissive of the emotions of people who challenged us. We repent of assigning motive to those who disagree with us or judging their character as lacking because they didn't agree. We repent of how our insecurity as leaders has prompted us to protect our influence and our power. We repent of how we have allowed the fear of the unknown to cause us to draw lines of belonging and making our church a place of us and them instead of a place of belonging and care and love. God, we repent for our lack of courage to stand for the weak and broken, those who do not have a voice. God, for these next two, I know that there are those in the room who have experienced them. And God, I pray that there would be just a a sense of your presence and healing and that some of these things, they will never get an apology from the person who did it. And so God, I pray that you would use this moment to bring healing to them and restoration. God, I ask for forgiveness 
for the emotional abuse that has come to anyone in this room through a leader of a church. The attempts to frighten, control, degrade, or manipulate. And God, I ask for forgiveness for any physical or sexual abuse that has been perpetrated on someone in this place by a leader in the church. Oh God, forgive us. God, we give this space to you and ask for you to move, to bring more healing or to bring us on that step of healing. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Meet us in our brokenness. Amen. And we're not done. We have another thing, but to move on from this moment where things may be stirred up, I think would be inappropriate. I want to invite the prayer team to come forward even now as I'm speaking. And I want to invite all of us to stand. Will you stand with me? I believe that God wants to do something right now. And that you've been stirred in your heart, but it may be time for you to come forward and receive more healing. We're going to sing a song. And I want God to move in the midst of us. And so I'm going to invite you to be part of that. Isaiah 40, 31 says that those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not be weary. But though some of us are weary, hurting and in pain because you've been carrying what's been done to you for too long, come forward and receive prayer. There are those of us who are choosing not to forgive we're choosing not to do it because we don't feel we can do anything else. What that was done to you was horrific. And what happens if I let them off the hook? Did that mean what they did was right? Who's going to make them pay? All these things come to a place where we have hold, held on to unforgiveness. And one popular writer, I don't know, remember off the top of my head who said it, but he said, unforgiveness is like drinking poison every day and expecting the other person to get sick and die. It is true. But I acknowledge that that pain is not something you can sometimes do on your own. So come and receive healing. And there's another group that realizes that they need to ask for forgiveness. And I want to invite you forward so we can pray for you and help you as you prepare to do that, to make things right. So I invite you to come forward right now, even as I'm talking. I got one more piece for you afterwards. But let's not move forward without giving the Holy Spirit time to breathe into us and to make us new.
of the collective us and so this is a prayer that the Lord will form his heart in us as a church so when I'm singing this song I'm thinking of everyone in this room that the Lord would turn our hearts to those who need him and turn our hearts away from any selfish ambition any Think that would be not like the Lord. And so when we sing this again, just think of God forming your heart to be like Him. God turning our hearts toward Him as a church. That His name would be made great in this valley, made great in the world. Let's sing it again in us. In us. In us, come have your way, oh Lord, in us, in us, your way. In us, in us, come for your heart, oh Lord, in us, Jesus, your heart. to believe that there are many who need prayer and we're going to keep doing this. I have one more point for you and I think it's important. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 11. What does restored leadership look like? What should we do? It says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each person must be careful how he builds for no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. As a leader in the church and a leader in your life, God has called you to build a foundation based on who he is, not on a person. And so we know that Brent followed the leading of God and began the work of the desert vineyard among the people God called him to. And David led us to be planted and established in this community and to bring so many to Christ and create a place of belonging. And Jonathan helped us enhance our ministry to the poor and the hungry. Each 
laid a foundation, but none of it would have worked if God wasn't the one causing it to grow. And so as a leader of this church, with the grace given to me, as the leadership of this church, we will build on the foundation of Jesus Christ and we will keep him first. As we end, I want us to affirm that together. I want us to sing that, that we'll build our life on Jesus. And no matter who you are or what the situation is, it is a firm place to place our feet. And so we're gonna continue to do ministry. I believe there are still who need some, some time with God. Let's do that. But don't leave, finish this song together as an affirmation that all will be restored if we keep the first things first. Let's worship.
let that declaration be more and more true every day, every day that we're together, every day of our lives. Let the foundation of your love be what we build our lives on. That unshakable foundation, unchanging love, unwavering love. Let us act and move out of that love so that those around us would see the light of you in us. It's in your strong name we pray. Amen. Amen. Two things. Two things. Those connect cards. We've got those connect cards for you. Um, fill those out and, and hand them in. I think we've got some places in the back for that. Also, at 1230, we've got free food for you. And we've got our town hall meeting. So stick around. It's kind of telling you about the state of the church, what's been going on, and just to encourage you about the year moving forward. Otherwise, God bless you. God comfort you and keep you. And we'll see you next week.